Podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second in the Jolly O' Curie program of webinars for 2019, um, aimed at early career researchers who are um, aspiring to uh, a long-term career in academia, academic research. And today's topic is all about how international experience can help to boost academic career prospects, and also maybe even more helpfully, how you can go about getting international experience. So. Just to introduce the panel today, that's me at the bottom. My name is Julie Franklin. I'm a career and professional development advisor at the Royal Society of Chemistry. And I'll tell you a little more about the services that you can get through our team at the end of the broadcast. But I'm also absolutely delighted that we've got two guests who know an awful lot about international experience from a personal and a professional perspective. Uh, I'd first like to introduce uh, Dr. Azel Sartbaeva. Uh, Azel, would you like to say hello to everybody and, and tell people what you do? Hello, thank you, Julie, for introducing me. Um, I hope everybody can hear me okay. So I'm a lecturer in chemistry at the University of Bath. Um, I started as an inorganic chemist, um, but um, sort of branched out into physical chemistry and biochemistry now. And uh, my, the topic of my research at the moment um, are porous materials and also how I can use inorganic materials to preserve vaccines and other biopharmaceutical products so that we can transport and store them without refrigeration. So uh, I'll be talking more about international experience uh, during uh, this webinar. Thank you very much. And uh, Stuart, Stuart is my colleague at the Royal Society of Chemistry um, from the international engagement team. So would you like to say hello Stuart and tell the, tell the listeners a little bit about what you do? Yes, thank you, Julie. Yes, hello, everyone. My name is Stuart Govan, and I'm a programme manager in the International Engagement Team at the RSC, where I've worked for seven years now. Prior to that, I was a journals publisher at the Institution of Engineering and Technology, where I worked for 12 years, including one year in Beijing in China. So combining these two roles, I have almost 20 years experience in the STM not-for-profit sector and a lot of international experience thrown in. And just a little bit about what I do in my current role. The role of the international engagement team is to support the RSC strategy internationally. We enable collaboration, advanced research, strengthen UK chemistry links with other countries and generally build international relationships. And how we do that, I work with colleagues at the RSC to organise events big and small. They could be, for example, the UKM's Congress, which was hosted in the UK in 2018, or smaller bilateral research symposia that we organise with other chemical societies and funding bodies. And then a third aspect of my job, which I hope will be of interest to our listeners today, is I'm responsible for the RSE's collaboration with the British Council on what's called the Researcher Linked Programme, and also for our collaboration with uh, UPAC, the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry. And both of these involve giving early career researchers the opportunity to get international experience, and I can talk about them a little later in the webinar. Thank you very much, Stuart. So you can see we have a wealth of experience on our panel today, so I'm sure it's going to be a really useful and helpful session for you. Before we get going, um, I'm, I just would like to explain a little bit about the Jolly O'Curie programme for those of you who are not familiar with it. This is a programme that the RSC supports each year, and the aim of the programme is to, to, to support diversity and inclusion in academia, in academic careers. And we focus this programme very much on uh, um, postdoctoral researchers in their first or second job possibly who are aspiring to an independent career in academic research. Some of you listening may have been to a previous Jolly O'Curie conference. We do those on a roughly annual basis um, and now we've begun to supplement the conference with the with a webinar series each year too. Um, these webinars are, are will be put up on YouTube so if you want to listen again or if you want to recommend to friends that they listen in uh, you will be able to find them on YouTube um, in the fullness of time. The Jolly O'Curie programme itself is actually named for Irene Jolly O'Curie, who was um, a Nobel Prize winner uh, for chemistry back in the 1930s with her, jointly with her husband Frederick for their work on artificial radioactivity. And her work on radioisotopes forms the basis of a lot of 
uh, biomedical work and cancer treatments that go on today. And you may be aware of the fact that the RSC has, um, has a, a, a 175 faces of chemistry, which is on our website. You can see the web link there and you can find Irene Jolio Curie and read more about her story there. Um, the 2019 events in the series, are, we've just had the conference, the 11th and 12th of September, which was in Nottingham this year and was a great success. Uh, we've had one webinar already on um, essential skills for researchers. Um, we have this webinar today and the final one is on the 3rd of December, which is all about uh, negotiating academic workplace culture. So do put that in your diaries. You can find out more on the link um, at the bottom of that slide there. So just to talk a little bit about our agenda for today, and we will talk around these topics, not necessarily in this order, but I hope we will cover most of most of what's there. Um, why is international experience actually important to academic careers? And secondly, very importantly, what actually counts as international experience? We're going to listen to some personal experiences of um, how international experience can, can help you to further your academic career. And we're going to talk a little bit about what skills you can actually get through undertaking international uh, work. There's a lot of careers input into this, you know, me with my careers hat on. I'm very interested to know that once people have got this international experience, how they can actually present it to potential employers in a positive way. So we'll be talking a little bit about that. And then also that all important question, how you can actually go about getting international experience for yourself if you haven't already. And then we'll finish um, the webinar with a little bit of information about help and support if you're an RSC member that you can get through the RSC. So I hope um, during the, 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 the space of the next 50 minutes or so, you'll get a good understanding of uh, most of those topics from our speakers today. So to start the ball rolling then, in academic research, we do hear that getting international experience can actually help to boost your career prospects. And I'd like to know really, firstly, is this true? And secondly, why and how does it help? So I'm going to ask Asil first if she would uh, give, give us our, uh, the benefit of her wisdom on that. So, uh, yes, Julia, absolutely. The, um, we all sort of anecdotally know that uh, international experience helps uh, our career prospects in academia. So I wanted to sort of talk a little bit more about sort of uh, about all of this a little bit anecdotally, but also uh, I did uh, look up some numbers to, um, to show you through numbers that uh, it is actually true. So uh, according to the British Council and NASE, apparently 97% of um, uh, uh, post docs who, um, um, who were looking for jobs uh, after one postdoc have found a, a job um, within several months, uh, much faster compared to 49 uh, graduates who didn't have uh, international experience before. So that already shows us that international experience is important. Um, to, to talk a little bit more sort of anecdotally, we, when we talk about international experience, we talk mainly sort of about the, building the social capital. And we talk a lot about sort of building soft skills. But if you think about it, it's actually not just about soft skills. There's quite a lot of uh, hard skills which are being built too. If you look at the whole of the social capital of what we're building in ourselves when we are going for international experience, and here I'm talking about um, working abroad, uh, working in a different um, setting, working in a different university, going for conferences, going for workshops, um, collaborating internationally, so all of these experiences. There's quite a lot of skill building uh, going on during that time. Um, it's obvious if you're working somewhere, so obviously you are learning new skills, you're experiencing new new group, uh, you're building some new social interactions. Um, also, if you're in a different country, you're experiencing new cultural immersion. Um, also, there's quite a lot of uh, obviously acceptance has to be happening from your side if you are in a new culture. You need to uh, also build some adaptability, of course, um, and um, to, to build sort of um, those skills which um, let you to settle in in a new culture. When you are going somewhere new, you, uh, you are obviously taken out of your uh, per normal uh, setting and put into a new setting. So it, 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 it can be quite uh, stressful. It can be a little bit painful sometimes too, of course, but uh, with a lot of adaptability and acceptance, you can actually gain quite a lot from it. You're building your network, your communication skills, problem solving skills, planning, organization, 
also um, from the uh, sort of soft skills point of view, you're you're also building your you're, you're developing your character because you are developing your resilience obviously so there's quite a lot of things going on when you are going abroad to work somewhere else if we just talk about uh just looking if we just look at the going for a conference so you're going just for several days maybe um or a week somewhere else it's it's obvious that you will be building a lot of networking and communication skills uh, and uh, i i would really say that networking is incredibly important in building your academic career in the future and I will be talking more and more about it. So as you can see both both from the hard numbers we can see that it helps us uh, to develop our careers but also from the um, building our um, uh, social capital, building our skills is incredibly important for us uh, to do um, to, to do, do international um, uh, did you have in international experience? Okay, thank you very much, Asil. Uh, Stuart, I'm sure you'd echo a lot of what um, a lot of what Asil's just said there. But from your perspective, what would you think the, the the main benefits are really? How they can help to boost your career prospects? Yes, Julie, I, I would totally agree with what Asil said, and really just summarise that perhaps in, in in five points. I think the first one is that. It, definitely gives you exposure to new techniques, approaches and ways of thinking because people in different countries will, will approach the same problem often in different ways and it's very useful to get exposure to that. And personally, I spent some time in Russia and it was really, really insightful to see how researchers in universities there, perhaps not with the same amount of resources, approach the same problem in a, a creative way um, getting around the fact they didn't have the resources, but they approached it um, differently. So that, that that was a real insight for me. It also gives you the exposure to different systems and ways of working, and 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 Asil touched on this. It's just a completely different culture, and my time in China definitely shows me that that um, just the way that Chinese researchers, Chinese people, Chinese companies, Chinese universities approach things in 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 a different way, which is all based on the Chinese culture. So it, having an, an insight and exposure to that, I think is very, very useful. Then there's the, the cross collaboration and teamwork, the interdisciplinary working, which of course you can get both domestically and internationally. But I think when you when you go abroad and you work internationally, that really emphasizes that and, and builds, these, builds these really essential skills. It widens your professional network, and I fully endorse what Ethel said about networking. I think that's one of the most important things, your approach to having an open approach and being open to all sorts of new experiences. Uh, so definitely when you when you go abroad and work internationally, you should be open to that. And then boosting your self-confidence. So, so again, Ethel said there about you, you might be put outside your comfort zone and you might have to stretch yourself a little bit when you go into work internationally but that is a very good thing and if you think about what potential employers might be looking for they're looking for somebody who's confident and open to new experiences willing to learn and the fact you can demonstrate that on your cv and when you potentially have an interview that you've been abroad really bringing out these aspects i think is is a great thing that you can do and international experience helps you with that. Thank you, Stuart. Well, thank you both. And I think what's come out clearly from that is that, you know, it's a mixture of the technical skills and very much the personal skills and interpersonal skills that you can develop that make this such a worthwhile thing. And I think it must be a great way to develop your own personal resilience as well. It may be hard at the time, but I think if you if you go into it knowing um, that it, it could be stressful at times, as I, as, as, as I said, um, you know, it, it's getting the best out of that and thinking what quality, what personal qualities you've developed for yourself. So if we could move on then, I mean, Ethel, you're the living example of uh, and the living evidence of how international experience can lead to exciting opportunities. So uh, would you just like to tell us your story? Uh, yes, of course. So um, I was born in Kyrgyzstan originally. So I was born during the Soviet Union and um, I can definitely echo of what Stuart said before um, about the resources in Russia. So I was studying, I was doing my degree during the Soviet Union time. And then uh, during my um, 
university time, the Soviet Union broke down and um, sort of it, it opened opportunities for us to be able to go uh, abroad. So um, at the time when I was studying there, um, a lot of our knowledge which we were getting was, uh, it was very good, but it was mainly theoretical because um, there wasn't a lot of experimental base, there wasn't many resources. So uh, I really wanted to actually try experiments, so I really tried hard to apply abroad. And um, I, when I got my scholarship to be able to go and do PhD in Cambridge, um, I took it with, um, I grabbed it with both hands, obviously, because I really wanted to try myself there. And uh, all of my PhD was experimental work. So I was doing a lot of experiments. It was incredibly new for me because uh, I've never done experiments before. And I absolutely loved it. So uh, after I did my PhD, I, um, my husband uh, got a um, an offer from US so we went to US and I didn't have a job actually for six months. Um, it was quite stressful time for me because um, obviously I was unemployed for six months but uh, because I had to wait for my work permit but after I got my work permit I, I, I got a, an offer for a very short position for six months only which uh, I took and actually that really uh, opened up my, ca my career because uh, after that um, I got uh, uh, an extension and uh, it was so successful that my boss um, uh, really uh, became my, my really good mentor. So he really supported me uh, in developing my career. So uh, after the postdoc, uh, so we were in US for three years. And again, it was a big change for my career because uh, I was doing very um, computational work there. So I had to learn again new skills. And uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't easy, I would say, but um, it definitely led to me actually getting an appreciation that uh, one can combine both experimental and um, computational skills. And that really led to, to where I am now, because now I'm uh, actually using both of them in my research. So that was really good for me to stretch myself there. So uh, at the time when we were in US, I started applying for in, uh, independent positions. I got a, a fellowship offer from Oxford. So we came back uh, to UK again. And that's where I started my independent career. Um, again, it was not easy because um, I had no um, skills uh, as a PI. I, I didn't know how to recruit students, how to get funding, how to sort of run my lab at the time. So I had to learn all of that uh, on the spot um, as, as, as trying to do the research and getting my ideas going. So, so it, it's, it's, not, um, it's not always easy to do that. But uh, the main thing uh, what I found was that uh, actually asking people for help, asking for assistance was uh, useful because a lot of people were uh, prepared to actually uh, support me and help me and advise uh, at what uh, and how I should be doing these things. Um, so then I got uh, support and I applied to URF, um, which I then eventually moved to Bath uh, where uh, I am now. So in the process, um, uh, during my career so far, I've moved um, continents, I've moved countries, and um, I'm actually speaking in my third language now. So my, my first language was uh, Kyrgyz, uh, and then I studied in Russian, and English is my third language. So uh, it's not always uh, easy, obviously, but um, with uh, um, with uh, acceptance, um, I guess, uh, of the culture where you are, uh, with open mind, um, I think it's easier to build those connections and uh, it's easier to sort of um, settle in. Uh, and um, I think it's important to recognize that um, you do uh, you do need to ask sometimes for help and uh, it's, it's okay to do that actually. Uh, and people are usually quite friendly uh, around and people are prepared to um, assist and uh, support uh, and give, give good advice. I think that's a really a really good point actually. I mean it's an exciting story, your story, and clearly all the experience you've had have contributed to your success. You've developed broader scientific knowledge. You know, you yourself said that you took on an area that you didn't feel confident in. I think people have to sometimes take their courage in both hands, don't they? Um, what other skills and qualities would you say that you gained that have helped you in the longer term? 
Um, I, I think communication was a big one where I had to learn. Uh, when I arrived to Cambridge, um, I wasn't a very good communicator, to be honest, and it took me a long time to be able to um, to sometimes even just to articulate what uh, what I needed or what I wanted to present or, or to speak about, you know. So it took a long time. So it's not a natural skill to me. And I think um, probably a lot of people would uh, would echo me there and to say that uh, with a lot of scientists, we, we don't sometimes have that as a natural skill. So it's something which we can develop. Um, another thing I think is um, not being stressed, and it's a, it's a really hard one actually, because we, we, we are stressed quite a lot of the times, but actually taking everything in our stride is another important thing I think which, which helps. Um, so, and uh, yeah, and networking is another thing which I, I will mention a lot of the times during this uh, <laughs> webinar, yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, well, that's good because really it is, you know, as you've both very much emphasised, a very important thing that you can get and, and grow your network. Um, if we turn now to the different types of international experience that you can get, um, you know, obviously getting a job overseas would count as international experience, but that's not, not the beginning and end of it, really. Um, what about other experiences such as attending conferences like we've mentioned and seminars, exchanges, collaborations and so on? Are all of these important? Two. I'm going to ask Stuart to answer that one first, please. Um, I, I would say definitely, Julie, all of these matter, yes. And my advice would be that you should try to expose yourself to as many different experiences as you can, for they all offer slightly different things. You, you mentioned international conferences, which I'm sure many of our listeners today have already attended an international conference. And these are a great way of learning, but in a relatively short space of time about the very best research in your area. Uh, but, but these are great because they, they're attracting the very best international speakers and getting the opportunity to listen and meet these people is, is a great experience in itself. I, I personally went to Brazil. I took um, a number of uh, researchers from the UK to Brazil for a conference a few years ago, and George Whitesides, was was speaking there and he's a very well known chemist obviously and, and it was just such a great experience for me personally but also for the the researchers who were there with me they all said it was just just to listen to to george whitehouse speaking it was a tremendous um learning experience for them recently i was in paris for the iu Park world congress and met nobel prize winners there ben Feringa and um and various other people. And again, just learning from them was really, it was a privilege and, and a real insight. And then of course, it's, it's a great way of showcasing your own work to people uh, uh, who might potentially be your next employer. So it's very important that you make a good impression. And But, th but then you have other forms of international experience. You have exchanges, as you mentioned, Julie, and these give you the opportunity to practice to different kinds of skills. and but equally important perhaps over a longer period of time, over a month or three months, and the number of, a number of um, grants that the Royal Society of Chemistry offers uh, enable you to go abroad for up to three months. And, and that gives you the opportunity to build relationships, to work together in the lab, to, to learn new ways of doing things, but it's, it's over a longer period of time and it, brings, it gives you that opportunity to develop both the technical skills that, that I mentioned earlier and also the, the soft skills that both Azel and I have mentioned, the, the interpersonal and personal soft skills that enable you to just develop a more rounded, a more rounded experience. So I, I would basically say yes, all of these are very, very important and um, try and expose yourself to as many of them as, as possible. There was just one thing I was going to add there. Um, about the researcher links workshops. This is something I mentioned in my introduction, and both Etil and I have an experience of these. But these are workshops which organised by the British Council that the Royal Society of Chemistry participates in. We match fund these chemistry workshops who take place all over the world, in, in Indonesia and in, in India. The feature of these are the focus on real world global challenge problems and I have been to a number of them. I've been to some in India, and the workshops I've attended, they involve trips to local communities to see the research in action. 
But this is a great experience to get if you can, because so much research funding these days is is based on global challenge problems. We have the global global challenge research fund and so on. So getting access to to these sort of experiences if you can are are really really useful. Yeah, yeah, I can, as well as being fascinating experiences for yourself, I indeed, guess too. Yes, yes indeed, exactly. Yeah. Uh, Asa, what what would your take on that be in terms of different types of international experience and what you can get from them? Um, yes, uh, what what uh, Stuart just now said was uh, um, yes, really great. Uh, I think uh, I, I absolutely agree with what he said. Uh, all of these are important. Um, just as an example, um, I wanted to say that uh, it's really worthwhile um, uh, going to conferences and actually speaking. And when I say speaking, I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that. Speaking to PIs who you think you want to work with in the future. Because um, what you what you don't want is just to say hello, I'm such and such, and because uh, we meet so many people uh, at the conferences that we we just forget. But it's, it's interesting that um, as a PI myself now, you know, I remember people who actually come uh, to me, and they, I know that they've invested some time and actually looked up what I do, and they're interested in, or for example, they're interested in what I want, what I what I'm doing. Which means that when we have the conversation, I, I then remember that conversation, and uh, it's important because if that person then is is applying for a, a job in my group, um, I'm definitely going to remember that person and probably will consider them uh, for, a, for a position. And I've had that before. Uh, my One of my students recently actually was applying for jobs. And uh, we uh, we went to a conference together where he met, um, well, a PI, his PI now, actually. And um, they they talked. Uh, and when he applied, now it was... Um, it was, of course, easier for him uh, to sort of go through the in interview stage and everything because he already knew the PI beforehand, which meant that he already sort of, they already had that connection. So um, I definitely invest uh, into going to conferences and actually have having uh, really meaningful sort of conversations with different groups um, because there is a potential that you might be working with them in the future and even if uh, you're not going to be applying for job with them maybe maybe you will be collaborating in the future and again that's an important connection uh, if you've built beforehand it actually helps in uh, then developing that collaboration uh, in the future. I think that's very sound advice. I mean, with my career specialist hat on, you know, we do encourage people to raise their profiles, you know, to go to events where they're likely to make a personal impression on employers who might they might want to work with. You know, there's nothing quite like that personal contact um, to be remembered. And I think for anyone listening who's a bit scared of that awful word networking, I wish we could call it something else because it really does have negative connotations. But really what you've just described there, as Ill, you know, talking to somebody about a mutual interest that you have in common isn't stressful, is it? You know, it's enjoyable, actually. So I think if you if you do take a deep breath, yes, and launch yourself in, really just go and be yourself and talk mm -hmm. about what interests you and be interested in what other people do. You yeah. know, that is networking, isn't it? Yeah. OK, thanks very much, both of you. So again, you know, looking at uh, we all have to earn a living and looking at um, future employers and, and how they might view international experience. Um, I wonder from from your points of view, how you successfully present your international experience to a future employer. Um, and so perhaps you could tell us how you've done that successfully in the past. So my take on this is that um, difference, um, and when I talk about difference, I'm talking about uh, when we are going to a new country, new new group, uh, we are inevitably different to that setting. Difference is a strength and seeing uh, it actually lets us seeing things from a different perspective. So I always presented that as my big strength. Mm. Um, I, I personally, as a PI now, I think diversity is, is great for the groups. So um, again, as a PI, um, I think so too. But when I was applying for jobs, um, I always presented the, the um, my difference sort of being different to everybody else around as as a big plus mm. or or several pluses actually so definitely when you are applying for a job i would present your international experience through giving good examples so i'm, I'm just going to give you an example of how i would do it 
So um, in the past before, um, in 2013, um, I went uh, for uh, a conference uh, with uh, RSC to Indonesia and Malaysia. Uh, and actually, as we were flying through Singapore, I actually stopped also in Singapore and um, started some collaborations there. But anyway, that's not the, this example is not about that. So um, when we went to uh, Indonesia, I met um, somebody in Indonesia who um, who I thought would, would would be a great collaborator for me. And we we sort of instantly click from the beginning. We we sort of when we started talking, we were both excited about zeolites. So it was clear from the beginning we would be collaborating in the future. So we sort of exchanged emails, and then we were in one contact. And then um, a layer a, a year later, we applied for funding together and got the funding to organize this researcher link. Um, conference uh, uh, workshop, which um, Stuart has mentioned earlier. So we organized it in Bali in 2015, and that was really great time for uh, us because we both were we, we was we are sort of in at the same stage of our career. So we were just building our research groups at the time. We were trying to establish ourselves, and um, it was great for us to be able to invite senior researchers there, but also meet a lot of sort of uh, a lot of uh, slightly junior than us people who are now our collaborators. So it was a great time. Um, so it helped us um, in terms of CV points, um, it's, mm. it's funding. So we were successful at uh, getting funding. We were successful at uh, getting an international collaboration. And also we organized an international conference both. So again, it's another big CV mm. point. So just through uh, through doing all of that, and it was all of it was a lot of fun because um, it involved um, going to another country, spending time in Bali, um, talking about uh, a lot of interesting science. So it was really great. Um, but uh, in terms of CV boost, it was huge. And in terms of boosting both of our careers, it was it was a really big step for us. So if you can give an example like that, I, I, I don't think any PI uh, would take it lightly. I think I think it's a it's a big plus for, for you in the future. So I would definitely go go through giving examples like this. OK, thank you very much. And uh, Stuart, uh, what would your take on that one be? Um, I, I would say there are three things here. I would say the first one is how has your international experience shaped your personal qualities? Um, things I'm talking about here are things like confidence, your ability to fit in, flexibility, adaptability, your team player approach. All, all these sorts of things are things which can you can really get from international experience. And as ACL says, you really want to be providing examples of, of, of that. I think the second thing is what insight has it given you? So international experience gives you the opportunity to see things from a different perspective. So what new ideas can you bring to the, the group or the company as a, as a result of what you have done and seen? So I mentioned the research linked workshops and ASL have touched on it as well. And you, you, might, you might have gone to one of these workshops, you might have had a visit to a, a local rural community, for example, and you might have just seen there a potential application for your for your research, a, a, a new angle to take, a new application, and any potential employer is going to be interested in these sort of um, insights. So again, if you have an example, as ASL says, you should be definitely highlighting that. And then the third thing I think is how has your international experience enhanced your, your technical and your scientific skills. What new knowledge or techniques have you picked up, for example? Um, you may be a materials chemist, let's say, and you might have been on a, a workshop or, uh, or, or an exchange and picked up some really useful experience in analytical chemistry or, or just had interaction with analytical chemists. So, and these you might have picked up New experiences, ACL mentioned also uh, earlier, I think, about being uh, the, the computational side and picking up that skill too. So, so you really want to be highlighting how your international experience has um, developed these technical and scientific skills. What you're looking to show your potential employer is that you 
your international experience has benefited you personally and also professionally. And then crucially that you can translate that benefit into the employer's team or company. Um, you're, you're looking to show how useful you can be. And I think the rest is really just standard interview things, which um, Julie could perhaps give even more information on preparation, presentation. Um, it's what Isel said again about when you're given that opportunity to speak to somebody, whether they're interviewing you or it's just somebody you're bumping into at a conference, you want to make the absolute most of that opportunity. So in the case of applying for a job, writing a good covering letter, researching the employer and then applying your skill set to them. So I think they're the main things I would highlight. Yeah, thanks very much, Stuart. And as you mentioned, Stuart, um, you know, one of the one of the services that the RSC's um, careers team provides, so that that's our team, is to actually help you with applications. If you're a if you're a member of the RSC, I'm going to give you our email address at the end of this uh, broadcast. And if you have any queries about that, then by all means get in touch with us, and, and we would be able to help. Because the other thing I should mention at this point is I know you're all uh, you're aspiring to a career, um, an independent career in academia, and I'm sure some of you will 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 go down that route. Others of you. May May change your mind you may decide that you want to do something else or do something different in that case all of these skills that you're picking up whilst getting international experience are very very transferable in many different contexts and if you want help with knowing how to present that as part of a job application and you are a member of the RSC then please do get in touch with the careers team because we can we can help with that so that having been said, we now come to the all important question about how can you go about getting international experience if you haven't already? And I'm, I'm going to ask Stuart to answer that one first, please. OK, Julie, um, I, I'm obviously here as an, an employee of the Royal, Royal Society of Chemistry. So I'm perhaps, forgive me for being a little bit biased, but I would <laughs> definitely say use your learning <laughs> society and, and use your university for that matter as well. The same, the same principles apply. Um, if you're a member of a learning society like the RSC, you should be making the most of it. There are all sorts of direct opportunities for international experience, from conferences that we organise to the grants that we provide to the exchanges that I've talked about that we do in collaboration with other organisations. So be proactive, um, apply, really make the most of the opportunities. I, I could cite the example of one person who, in the space of one year, successfully applied for an RSC bursary to go to the IUPAC Congress. This was two years ago in Brazil. They also attended a Newton Fund workshop. When I say Newton Fund, this is related to the research links workshops that we, we do. This is a UK government initiative that provides the funding for these. So, so this, this the person in question, she really used all the resources available to her and, and got a lot of international experience as a result of that. And a nice postscript to that is that she's recently received an, an RSC award this year. So it shows that that um, really making the most of the resources can really help your career and, um, and further it. Um, I had a few other things here. Volunteer network, be visible. That word again that we use networking, but it really is so important. The, the maxim about the more you put in, the more you will get out. And I had another example here of a young researcher in, she wasn't even a researcher actually, she was uh, um, earlier in her career than that, but she was became aware of a researcher links workshop we were organising in in India, and this was being organised by Sir Tom Blundell at the University of Cambridge, and she just went along as a volunteer. She she was really just doing, I think, uh, helping out with things like the, the the catering and the signage and showing people where to go. But she made such a good impression there. Uh, she was so enthusiastic, so open, so so much so that um, Tom Blundell noticed this and was very impressed and said, why don't you come to Cambridge um, for, for six weeks and just, just come to my lab and, and, um, and get some experience of England. And, and for, for somebody so early in her career, this was just a fantastic opportunity. And she, made, she didn't just rest on, on her laurels, if you like, but once she came to Cambridge, she then made the opportunity the effort to come to the RSC visit us here in Cambridge and she was really networking it, re it really was networking at its very very best 
and making the, the most of, it, of every opportunity. So stay, I, I would say, try and be like her, make, every op, make the most of every opportunity. And stay informed, use the RSC website to keep abreast of opportunities. If, if, if you are an RSC member, we announce all our international bursaries and grants on, on the website, and we tweet about it as well if you're on Twitter. Network, um, that word again, join our divisions, join the interest groups, go to events. And then the, the final thing I would just say is once you get that opportunity, and Isel touched on this earlier as well, and once you're in the country, make the most of make the most of that opportunity. In the case of the RSC, is there an RSC local section in the vicinity, for example? And if there is, you could be contacting them in advance and asking them if they could put you in touch with people. Um, when when our research and mobility grant winners go abroad, we encourage them to maximise their time in the country and perhaps visit other research groups when they're there. And, um, and then learn the language is the final thing that uh, I think you mentioned that, Julie, right mm -hmm. at the beginning. But if, if you learn the language, it does make such a difference. And, it, and I, I can think of somebody who she she was a postdoc in, in the University of York. She now actually works for Bayes. Um, so that shows what, what Julie was saying about your career can change. It doesn't necessarily need to follow one track. But when she went out to Brazil, she really made the effort to integrate, learned Portuguese, and she subsequently got invited back. So by making that little bit mm -hmm. of effort, she got so much more out of that visit and subsequent visits. So that's that's a number of things here. But that's yeah, what thank, I would say. yeah, thank you very much, Stuart. And we are going to put some um, web links up at the end of the broadcast um, to RSC resources that, that we've been talking about throughout. Um, Esa, how about you? The all important question, how, how would you recommend that people go about getting international experience? Yes, yeah, so, so Stuart gave really great advice here. So um, I'm just, I'm not going to uh, repeat it, but I'm just going to add to it a little bit. So from my experience, so, um, I think uh, really try to grab the opportunities when when uh, when they are when they exist and actually make the opportunities too. That's that's, that's another thing. So just uh, just as an example, um, I was uh, so I went to this um, conference with uh, RSC in 2013 to Indonesia and Malaysia. But on the way, I, I knew I'm going to be flying through Singapore. So I was talking to international office here at Bath uh, about it. And they said, oh, you know what? We, we are actually trying to build a link with the NTU in Singapore. Would you, would you like to maybe stop there for several days and talk to people? That's all they asked me to do, just, mm -hmm. just to stop and talk to people. That was it. They gave me money to, to do that, actually. So uh, I went there and I spent three days. Um, I contacted everybody who I could contact there, uh, made lots of meetings, talked to a lot of people. And as a result of that, actually, um, I gave several seminars there and also talked to um, uh, chemistry, um, uh, head of chemistry there, who said, uh, oh, we, we also want to build links with Bath. Uh, shall we organize uh, maybe uh, an international conference? So I found myself actually organizing a bilateral conference between NTU and Bath a year later, which was great again, actually, uh, it, because NTU gave me money to do that. So again, that ticks another box again, funding. And uh, they they came here to Bath. Uh, we organized a meeting together. We uh, had um, collaborations starting. And as a result of that, actually, we've just recently published a paper uh, in a very high impact journal. So. Um, all in all, it was actually a great thing which came out just from me talking to the international office and sit here and saying, "Oh, I'm going to be flying through Singapore." So that, that was that was what started the whole thing. Yeah. So as you can see, uh, one can argue that I sort of uh, made it into an opportunity and actually developed it. And uh, I think uh, any any of us could do that. Actually, it's possible because there are always links out there. So yeah, as long as you actually maximize those maximize those opportunities, you will find that uh, lots of things actually happen and lots of doors open for you too in the future. OK, that's that's a really great advice about how you can make something work for you, I think. Now, you know, we do hear um, from a lot of people who are early career researchers about, you know, facing barriers um, to their skills development. And I wondered whether you could um, maybe 
tell us what some of those might be? So what do you think are the biggest barriers to this kind of development for researchers in your experience? Um, from my experience, I think um, uh, something which, um, th there are two things, I think, something which we can effect and something which we can't actually change. So one thing which we can't change, unfortunately, is the short-term contracts. So something at the early, a lot of early career researchers have to uh, have to go through those short co uh, time contracts and I was on one of those. I was on a short, uh, on a sh very short six months contract to start with. So it's something which we can't change and uh, in the beginning uh, already uh, when I was going through it I decided well since I can't change it, I might as well just try to maximize opportunities, start, try to enjoy it as much as possible. And actually, that really helped me to relax into it. And so I was not worried too much that, oh my God, I need to look for next um, job, uh, but um, mm -hmm. actually do my job uh, to the maximum. And because it was so good, it was actually uh, then extended. Uh, so it was quite easy to extend. So I, I think, um, yeah, it's something which we can't change, so we might as well just accept it, I think, sometimes. Um, and another thing uh, which we can, uh, which we can uh, change is um, we, one, one of the biggest things is procrastination. And I think a lot of us, um, unfortunately, suffer from it. So, um, for example, I, I decided for myself that I'm going to always do some courses. So every year I, I make myself a plan on, on what I want to improve. So in the last two years, I've been working a lot on my media skills, for example. So I actually targeted and I went to a lot of media trainings specifically. So I would definitely recommend you, even even if you are on a short-term contract, um, and especially if you are an early career researcher, really try to think of the skills you need to develop and try to, to develop them because they will help you in the future, uh, definitely. And they will help you with your um, international experiences too. So I would definitely recommend you to go for, for those if you can. So, so two things: uh, short-term contracts and procrastination. And uh, yeah, we can something we can do something about that. I think. Yeah, absolutely right. Thank you. How about from your point of view, Stuart? Um, I'm just going to keep it quite short and quite positive, actually, because I, I truly believe that the, the biggest barrier might just be thinking that there are barriers. I mean, I'm not dismissing what you yep. yeah, said, yeah, sure because it is very true. There are some real world. Um, problems out there that you just have to accept but also if you have the right positive mindset then there are so many opportunities and resources available these days and it just comes down to making the most of it so if you have that positive attitude you can overcome an awful lot right say. yeah that's that's very good advice a lot of it is in, in our own hands and in our own heads but that brings us on nicely really because there is help and support out there for early career researchers who want to get international experience and um, uh, enhance their career prospects so I'm going to ask first of all um, Stuart um, certainly from the RSC's point of view there's there's a lot of stuff there that can help people so would you just like to give us just a quick whistle stop tour of some of the things that the RSC can, can provide? Um, certainly can yes so I, I, there are four things that I've highlighted here um, and the first three come under the category of grants we have RSC travel grants, we have research and mobility grants. For in my particular team, we have what's called Young IUPAC Young Observer Grants, and then we have the RSC conferences and events. So these were just the four um, headline areas. So in terms of the, the, the travel grants, first of all, so these are conference travel grants. So these are the RSC divisions. We're very keen to support PhD students and early career scientists participation in conferences and workshops. So they offer grants to cover um, domestic travel up to £200 or continental up to £400 and intercontinental up to £800. So that's travel to scientific conferences and um, you, you do need to be a member of the Royal Society for them. But these, these are excellent and they, they always they are so popular. Um, and so I would really encourage you, if you're already going to events and you want to go to more, then um, make the most of these conference travel grants. We also have um, research and mobility grants, which I've touched on before. So these grants are supporting PhD or early career researchers to undertake scientific visits, and they support the costs of travel and accommodation and day-to-day -day living 
for the duration of your visit, which can be up to three months. We provide up to £5,000 to make single or multiple scientific visits between the UK and overseas institutions. So it has to be between the UK and, and another country, so, but it can work both ways. So you can be a researcher in the US wanting to come to, come to the UK or vice versa. Uh, and these are, these are really, really popular and the the, the feedback we get from these and, uh, is really, really positive. And the, the experiences, again, the technical experiences, but also just the, the more the soft skills that we've talked about, um, everybody really, really appreciates them. So these are the research and mobility grants. I also mentioned um, the IUPAC bursaries. So we, we do, the, the RSC is the UK body representing IUPAC in the UK. And we, we do, if, every two years, our UPAC has its World Congress and General Assembly. And the RSC provides bursaries to attend these events. So the last one was in Paris in July. We had one in, in Brazil two years before that. They've been in Istanbul. They've been in Korea. So uh, you really get, if you apply to attend these, the, the the Congress, then it's a great opportunity to to go into an international conference and just experience all, all the benefits that we've already touched on. So these are available every two years. So the, the next IUPAC Congress will be in, in Montreal in Canada in 2021. So um, in 2020, we'll be opening bursaries for these as well. So that's another potentially interesting thing you, you might be interested in following up on. And then finally, it's just the RSE conferences and events. And Julie, I think you're going to put a link up to how you can find out more information on these. But um, it basically, the, the RSE has so many events in so many different areas of chemistry. There's bound to be one that will be of interest to you and um, definitely make the most of these. Um, whether they're whether they're international in the sense of being an international event outside the UK or an international event bringing international researchers to the UK, basically the same principles of networking and making the most of it. Yeah. Apply. Yeah. No, that's great. Thank you very much. I mean, I want to allow a little bit of time for questions, so I am going to move on now, and I am going to invite you, if you're logged in now and you have a question which uh, you think one of our, our panel could answer today, I'm going to put a final question to, to each of them, and while they're answering that question, do feel free to type in questions that you might have, and we will try to answer as many of them in the time that we've got as possible. So get typing now if you've got something to ask, but I'm going to ask one last thing from our panel now, and um, it, it's their final piece of information, if you like. So for both of you, if you had one piece of advice to offer an early career researcher at this point in their career, what would it be? And I'm going to ask Ethel first to, to give us her words of wisdom. Um, I think the, the the one advice I would definitely give is network, 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 because that that is the most important thing I think uh, as a, for an early career researcher. You need to establish yourself in, in the field. You need to make sure that other people know about you, about your work, uh, about the sort of area you are developing. And uh, the only way people will find out about you is if you uh, if you go to conferences, if you speak meaningfully to people if you present your work um, and uh, um, uh, of course if you if you if you talk to them and have conversations um, about um, various aspects of your research so um, yeah when I say network um, I'm really talking about this um, sort of uh, much more um, meaningful uh, in a meaningful way sort of really um, getting to know people uh, through engaging them uh, in conversations about um, things which you are doing and things which you want to do in the future also. Uh, and uh, yeah, this, this, you, you never know what, the, what this can lead to. So I would definitely encourage you to do that as much as possible. Okay, thank you very much. And Stuart, what would your one piece, of, your golden nugget of wisdom be? Um, <laughs> if it's not that one, because I think that's an excellent piece of advice that ACL has given and I would totally, uh, totally agree with that. But to add another one, mine would be, I, 
to make the most of your learning society. I've said it already, but it's so important and there are so many opportunities. So if you're an early career chemist and you're not a member of the RSC, I'd encourage you strongly to become a member. But if you are, um, ask yourself if you're making the most of it. Go to their website, find out what's available, contact us. Um, that would be my main bit of advice. Yeah, I can only I can only mm -hmm. go with that. You know, if you're a member, get your money's worth out of us is what I would say. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Uh, as a, as as a uh, as as a member of RSC, actually, yeah, I I definitely would mirror that because uh, and and don't just become a member and don't do anything about it. You know, there are so many things you can, so many ways you can engage with RSC. Um, I'm I'm, I'm yeah, I'm, I'm finding so many interesting ways. So I definitely would encourage you to speak to RSC much more and become a member if you're not. Yes, yeah. I, I'm just adding to that is, is the aspect of volunteering. Lots of yes. uh, actually goes back to what I said, the more you put in, the more you will get out and the more opportunities will present themselves by engaging and volunteering. So don't be afraid to do that. It, it, it will actually really enhance your career. And I think you'll find we're all uh, we're all very friendly people and we like to help our members anyway. And we love to hear from you. So, you know, please don't be don't be put off from from getting in touch with us if there's anything you think we could do to help. OK, I'm going to go to a couple of questions. We have one that says, does the program have assistance for recent PhD graduates with some industrial experience with lower publication output than their peers? in order to translate their expertise into a postdoc in Europe. So what do you think about, would either of you like to, to I guess the programme that we're talking about here is maybe some of the RSC, some of the RSC resources, would you think? Yes. Uh, so we're talking about somebody who's got some industrial experience, but maybe their publication record isn't as good as their peers. So how would somebody in that kind of situation um, approach getting some international experience? Um, I, th I think the researcher, if I can just speak for CCL, might have some comments as well, but from my point of view, the researcher mobility grants that I've mentioned already, you, you would be eligible for that. The fact that you don't have a strong publication output is, uh, at this point in time, is, is not a, a barrier to applying and it's not a barrier to becoming successful. Um, I, I have had some experience of uh, working with these grants and the criteria that are used are more about just how, how you present your case and it's important when you're presenting your case that you're showing how the, the visit will be of use to you. The, the fact that whether you have a, a long publication record is, is not is not the main thing. Okay. Equally, it's open to people from industry and from academia. And I know that, the, the, that we are very keen to encourage people from both from both uh, academia and industry. So I would, that, that would be my initial reaction. Okay. The research mobility grants. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Uh, so yeah, yeah, I would say that um, you know the the uh, publication record uh, is is a thing which um, you, you know uh, just as as a PI from uh, my point of view. Yeah, I I try not to look at number of publications. I'm more interested at how person actually. Uh, what, what do they say about their experience? So your industrial experience actually might be even more valuable than those uh, publications that other people have, you know. So um, if you present your industrial experience as a strength and as something which uh, which where you will be applying or where you want to be uh, is really valuable, I think that actually might 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 be a big plus for you compared to other people. So I would definitely present yourself more from from that strength point of view. Okay. So um, yeah, some something something like that, I would guess. Yeah, it really depends where you are uh, applying specifically. So if you're going for uh, an academic position, which I'm, I'm presuming here, yeah, you you can actually present um, present your case fr from saying, well, um, a lot of the uh, academics, a, a, a lot of researchers don't have any uh, academic ex uh, industrial experience, and I would definitely put more strength into that um, rather than just uh, talking about publications. Yeah, list. yeah, mm. I agree. You know, it's talking about your strengths, isn't it? You know, not making a feature of things which are, is going for the right things, as it is with all things in life. I think. Right, we have another question: Is is it possible for the RSC to help African members? 
members get international links in Germany or is it only in the UK? I think, Stuart, probably that's one for you. Is it about networks and...? Um, yes, I, I think... I, I think th th there are a couple of things here. So if if you are based in Africa and you're not aware of it already, there is the the Pan Africa Chemistry Network, which is an initiative that we have has been running with the RSC for a number of years now. And the, the, what this seeks to do is create a self-sustaining science base in Africa, helping to build capacity, solve local challenges, and contribute to global knowledge. But what being part of that network and getting involved in that, I think, would be a good way of of, of networking. Back to that mm, word again. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 there isn't there isn't a direct kind of link there between Africa and Germany, but what 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 there is is the potential to create an, an indirect link. Insofar as if you if you you join this network and, and you become engaged in the RSC and the RSC's divisions, its interest groups. You, you can you can use these you can use these networks to, to to further your own network and that might potentially lead to to um to the, the yeah why didn't it asking work? about, yes, about yeah, a, yeah, a link yeah. to germany so yeah. it's uh, it's not necessarily a direct link but just making that initial right. um, networking step could lead to something yeah, and I, you know, it is worth mentioning that we have got you know over fifty thousand members all over the world, and I think I'm afraid we haven't got time for any more questions now. If you did submit a question and we haven't had time to answer it, I'm going to show you our the careers team email address in in a second or two, and please feel free to send those questions to the careers team, and we will do our best to answer them for you. So apologies if we haven't had the time to get to to your particular question, but I, what I'm going to do now is I am going to move on and just show you some useful links and resources. Again, like I said, this webinar will be put up online on our YouTube channel, um, so you will be able to find this again. But the RSC's geographic networks are all over the world. You know, we have lots of them um, in, in all countries and continents, so it's certainly worth having a look at what networks are available where, where you are at the moment and maybe in areas where you would like to work. You know, there's nothing wrong with making proactive um, uh, efforts to make contacts in those countries before you go there. Um, there's also the RSC Early Career Network. Again, there's a link on the uh on the screen there, you will get the opportunity to meet all sorts of people from all sorts of background and all over the world through that early career network. So if, if that is your career stage, I would advise you to join that. Stuart and as I both mentioned, RSC conferences, and that's a very easy web link there for you to find them. These are all fairly easy things to find on our website, I would say. Um, RSC funding, which Stuart's been talking about a lot, that's how you can find out what funding we have there for grants for travel and research. Another thing that's worth mentioning as well is that our Chemist Community Fund um, are actually offering carers grants now. So if you're thinking to yourself, well, it would be lovely to attend events, but I have caring responsibilities and I can't go because of those, do have a look at what the Chemist Community Fund offers. They do offer grants to enable you to get um, caring assistance in while you attend events and conferences. So do have a look at that too. And then there's a campaign that we have about um, tackling global challenges that's something that as Stuart mentioned is a hot topic at the moment so you can find out what we do in that area there um, as I said the Jolly Oak Curie program for 2019 uh, our next webinar is going to be on the 3rd of December all about academic work-based culture so I hope some of you will uh, will join us for that too and I hope very much that you've enjoyed today's session I think there's been some absolutely fantastic um, links and and advice that have come from our two guests there so that, that that's absolutely great and i hope you can use it um, just a little bit about the rsc's careers team that's the team that i belong to we do provide support for members at all career stages we have one-to-one -one career consultations either in person or phone skype we can provide guidance on career planning applications interviews professional development we have a mentoring scheme we can help you with networking our web pages are up on the screen there and if you want to drop us an email or if you want to send a question to us that we didn't manage to answer today, then you can drop us an email very, very simply, careers at rsc.org.
So with all that having been said, that brings us to the end of this session. I would like to thank both of our guests very much. I would like to thank Asil and Stuart for their, their words of wisdom and their, their absolute golden nuggets of information there. So Asil, thank you very much. Would you like to say, uh, would you like to say any last messages to our listeners and to say goodbye? Um, thank you, Julie. So, yeah, it was really great to uh, to be able to talk with uh, um, Stuart and uh, you, Julie, and um, continue networking, networking and networking. <laughs> thank you very much. The final word. OK. And from Stuart, thank you very much, Stuart, from your, for, for your perspectives. And have you do you have a final message and maybe a, a goodbye for people listening? I'm going to say exactly the same as you say, actually. It's been a pleasure to be part of the the webinar and I hope you found it useful and I would just reiterate what Isel said, networking is the most important thing you can do. Okay, I have nothing more to add after that. I think that's fantastic <laughs> advice. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you've got a lot from it. It will be up on our YouTube um, channel. So do have another listen and encourage your friends and, uh, and, and co-workers to listen to. Uh, you know, this advice is golden stuff and we really need to, to get it out there to everyone who needs it. So thank you very much for listening today. And just from me, um, maybe I'll hear from some of you in the future, but I would just like to wish you all the best of success in your careers and good luck to you all. So I'll say goodbye for now. Bye.